Well, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I, I'm preaching again. I know some of you guys are like, oh my gosh, what's happening? No, I'm kidding. Um, so I'm going to, um, how many got the email? We're going to do some financial overview, some vision stuff. But I do have a word from the Lord, so um, just kind of bear with me for the beginning part if it bores you. It doesn't bore me because it's exciting. Um, so, um, but then I have something the Lord gave me. Is everybody good this morning? Yeah. Did you enjoy that time of worship? So stay, hang out. I'm going to try to keep it sweet and short so that we can uh, have lots of time to fellowship and have some walking tacos together after service. Um, so Hannah Banana, my baby girl in the back, will you just put up that first slide for me, princess? So um, this is just a, a really quick snapshot of 2022, 2021, kind of where we are financially as a church. Um, it's, it's important that we talk about these things. We talk about the goodness of God because sometimes we don't see what he's doing in the natural until he like reveals it to us and shows us. And so I want to give you guys an overview of what we get to see, which is a beautiful thing. Um, our trustees and us and just all the things that we're uh, been able to see. So I kind of gave a snapshot of where we were kind of pre-COVID and where we are now. And so if you can look at that beginning slide, that first um, that first little section, our account balance. So pre-COVID, before shutdown, before all that stuff, we had $149,000 saved in the bank as a church. It's great. But in just two years, less than three years, a little over two years, less than three years, we've been able to save over $500,000. So our current account, is, isn't that awesome? So our current account is $516,700, and that grows every single week as we, um, say, or every month as we save, you know, money in our account. Um, the next um, little section there, pre-COVID, pre-shutdown, our average monthly attendance was 163 people, which is great. It's a great church size. Um, but we've been able to grow as a community. And sometimes these are good questions to ask because why are we looking at a building fund? Why are we, you know, why do we want to finish this? First of all, it's God's building and he builds his house, right? And so what we're doing is we're finishing some unfinished business as a church community. We believe that God has great plans for our church and our community. And so... Um, so that's why we, you know, t take attendance and things like that. Um, butts and seats is not God's priority, but it is in a way because it means people. Amen. Um, so as our average monthly attendance in 2022 was about 272 people, which is awesome, which is also um, a good thing to, for us to think about because even with 272 people, we can't all fit in one service yet. And so when we move into that new building, we'll be all, all be able to go to one service and worship together. How many are just looking forward to that? I know our worship team is, our serve team is, our pastors are, because um, that will be nice. So our average monthly income, again, 2022, the beginning of the year, was about $25,000 a month as a church. Um, now, as you grow as a church, uh, expenses grow and things like that. But our average monthly income is about $55,000. And that's how we've been able to save that $500,000. And so that's kind of um, a little snapshot of just where we are currently in our finances. And um, I want to talk about the Heart for the House. How many remember we did a campaign in December for the Heart for the House? Um, 49, we, we wanted to raise $50,000, $49,970 came in. Can you just thank the Lord? I was talking to my daughter about this the other day. Like sometimes the Lord is not early, but he is never late. Sometimes it is not, it's, it's never, <laughs> sometimes it's just enough, right? It's just right there. It's good. So good. So I wanted to talk about why heart for the house. Like why did we do that? So between um, we are working towards getting a loan for our building. Um, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. But before I go there, um, we had a, a, a decrease from 2021 to 2022. We lost probably, I think we said like maybe six families, about 60 people 
move to the Carolinas. It's the it's New York State's fault. So um, we can blame them because it was the number one state that people fled post COVID, um, and so we felt that as a community. And so um, we did lose some some families. Um, some families that, that moved to the Carolinas are still sowing into our ministry. They still watch every Sunday, and they still believe in what God's doing. And so that's huge. It's such a. I mean, I can't even. Sometimes we'll text them and we'll just say, you know what, I mean, just you guys are amazing. So um, why did we need that? Because of the decrease we saw from one year to the next, a bank didn't want to see more than 6% decrease. So that little bit, that $50,000 set us right at that 6% so that a bank doesn't see us going down in a decline. Um, the bank's looking at 40 years of history, and we have seen this only since mid-2020. And so a bank is saying, well, is this just a fluke, or is this a real thing? And how many know we think it's the real thing? God says it's the real thing. And so that kind of helps set us right at that place that we need to be so that we can get our bank approval. So that's why, I don't know if we really fully communicated that, but I wanted to tell you that um, we got there and we're, we met all of our goals. And so now I want to go towards um, our forward campaign and where we're at. So this is really exciting. So I said we have over $500,000 saved, right? Our land sale closes, not by our fault, it's their fault. They haven't closed yet, but they're closing. <laughs> you guys um, know we, we did a vote a couple, about a year ago, and we sold, I think, um, about five acres in the back of our, of, uh, of our land right here to the development that's already back there. And we're gonna net about maybe a little over four, that's a conservative amount, and we're gonna net $400,000. They're also going to fix the divot in, um, in the land and do some other things for us. So that's what we're going to net. So in a matter of 30 to 60 days, as a church community, we're going to have over $900,000 cash on hand. And I don't know about you, but that's a lot, of, that's a lot that we can use for his kingdom. Amen? Um, and so we kind of, um, it's been kind of a really a blessing in disguise that we've not been able to um, to really start the building project with different reasons, but um, the cost of things have gone down. So they were going up and up and up and up and up, and now they're coming down. And so um, we get to take advantage of a recession, that that's what the world calls it, but how many know sometimes what the world says, God sets his people up for blessing. And so um, our new estimated cost to complete our project is about $2.1 million. And that does sound like a lot of money, but it really isn't that much when you look at everything we already have and what we've already done. Like, it's already, there's already a whole shell. And I don't know, some of you guys might not have might not been back down there, but um, we're going to start doing some tours again and some worship sessions in there once it warms up a little bit. So... Um, New loan amount that includes current mortgage. Oh, okay. So our um, our loan amount that we have right now, the loan that we have on our church is three hundred twenty five thousand um, dollars. We're planning on putting in eight hundred thousand total. We've already invested a hundred thousand. We've um, d we've done plans and and um, we have stamps approval. We've had we are approved with the city to move forward. We've done a lot of behind the scenes work, and so we've already invested about a hundred thousand dollars into the new project, the Ford campaign. So our plan is to invest another seven hundred so that we can still have a good chunk of, in our savings as a church. I mean, know that's important. Um, and so we're uh, expecting a total new loan amount of 1.5 or under, so um, which is um, approximately eight to nine thousand dollars more a month than what we already currently pay, and that's that is very doable with what we've been saving every single month. And so I just wanted to give a little snapshot of where we are financially as a church. Um, you know, we do have trustees. We go through these things every single month. We go through, um, you know, we go through all of our finances with them every month. So we are in a very good place financially as a church. 
And so I'm excited about that. I'm excited about what we've been able to accomplish and um, with, with, with you guys, with the faithfulness of God's people. You know, um, sometimes as leaders, you know, you don't, you don't always feel like that, that you're going in the right direction or you don't always know for sure that, that God's with you. But there are, there are tangible things and there are spiritual things that we hold on to. And when we open our heart to see the tangible, this is tangible, not a lot of churches post-COVID have been able to save over a half a million dollars. It's just not what happens. It's not what's happening. Um, so that's a tangible. And then there's a spiritual thing, and it's God's presence and his glory and his goodness. And when you bring those together, you just experience just the love of God and the approval and the stamp of his goodness over us. And so I just want to encourage you in Counter Church, just receive the stamp of the approval of the Father over you. Because he's good and he's faithful and he's been good to us. Amen? And I, have, I just have some stuff from the Lord I felt this morning. And of course, you know, I, I got to preach last week and my computer's yelling at me. Um, I got to preach last week, and I really bared my heart for service. And so, um, yeah, so I, I apologize for that. No, I'm kidding. I don't. <laughs> no apology. Um, but I did bear my heart because I really believe that, I believe with all of my heart that God has a mission and a goal for his people and there's a hunger inside of us as a community, and I want you to know that that hunger that's inside of you is also in your leaders. We're hungry for the same thing. I want an outpouring, but more than I want an outpouring, I want to be an outflow of what God has put inside of me. And so, um, so when I totally bared my heart last week, Thank you for opening your heart to that. And I kind of want to follow up. You know, Zach's like, you're doing it again next week. And I was like, okay, Lord Jesus, help me. So, um, so I, don't, I don't think I'm going to read all the scripture I have because it's a lot of scripture. I was going to read all of 2 Samuel 6, but it's long. So I'm just going to briefly go over it. Is that fine? Are you guys okay with that? So 2 Samuel 6 is this really cool chapter in scripture. And it's uh, David is bringing the ark back to, um, he's bringing the ark back to Jerusalem. And on his way back to Jerusalem, um, I'm, some of you guys probably know the story, um, but it says that David and all the house of Israel, they were playing music on all kinds of instruments of fir wood, harps and stringed instruments and tambourines, on, on um, cymbals and strings, and something happened to the ark, and Yuza tried to fix it, and God struck him dead. Okay, it's a little bit scary. And these were, in verse 1, it says, the choice men of Israel. Okay, so these were like the top picks, number one picks, and then one's dead already. All right, let's move on. Okay. <laughs> Then in verse 11, they had to stop on the way to Jerusalem, and they stopped in, um, in the house of Obadiah. And in verse 12, it says, The Lord blessed the house of Obadiah and all that belongs to him because the ark of God. So David went up and brought the ark of God to the house of Obadiah to the city of David with gladness. Okay? So that's one, part one, Uzzah dies. Part two, the house of Obadiah is blessed. Part three, you guys ready? Then they brought the ark into the city, starting in verse 14. David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod, so his underwear. Are you thankful that we don't dance in our underwear? I'm thankful that I don't have to see you dance in your underwear, and you're probably thankful you don't have to see me dance in my underwear. Okay, so David and all the house of the Lord, went. Um, they brought the ark with them, shouting, with the sound of the trumpets. And then the ark of the Lord came to the city of David. And Michal, Saul's daughter, 
looked through the window and saw David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Verse 21, it says, David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all the house to appoint me ruler over the people. And I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for your people. I thank you for this church. I thank you that we're moving up and we're moving forward and that you have good plans for this house, God. And I thank you, Jesus, that you are doing mighty, mighty things in our midst. We love you, Lord. So I want to talk this morning about things that happen when you become a carrier of the glory of God. First, I want to say this, that do you know that you are a carrier of the glory? See, so many times we're always looking for an outpouring, but God wants you to be infilled with his presence, that you become an outpouring, that we become an outpouring, that together that we're saying, no, God, I don't need to go anywhere. I don't need to do. I want to be everything that you've called me to be. I care your glory. First Corinthians 13 says, and I want to, I want to remind you that this old covenant, um, example to us of what the glory of God looks like is just a shadow of what Jesus accomplished at the cross. Because now first Corinthians three sixteen says, do you not know that you say me, you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you. No longer do we, do we go to an ark for an outpouring of the spirit, but the spirit of God, the very ark, lives inside of you. The very ark of God lives inside of you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. See, we are the ark of God. Our hearts, John 7, the Bible says our hearts are like rivers of living water. We can either allow ourselves to be a river or we can dam it up. I, I don't know about you, but I have damned things up. And I feel like Yuza was trying to control what was happening. There was a fear inside of him that, that God wouldn't be able to take care of his own house, that God wouldn't be able to take care of his own ark. So there was something that grew in the heart of uh, Uzziah. And so, right, Uzziah, yes. Something that grew in the heart of Uzziah and said, well, I need to steady this. I need to put my hand hands on this or I need it to I'm I'm afraid of what it's going to ha- what's going to happen. And so something that happens inside of us is we're afraid I'm afraid of what it's going to look like or I'm afraid of what I'm going to look like. I'm afraid of my reputation or I'm afraid what about my kids or what about my family? And the Lord's saying if you just become an outpouring of the glory of God it doesn't matter. There's no fear that lives in the place of his love. See, I can tell you places in my life that have not been fully overcome with the love of God because those are places that still have fear rooted inside of them. When God's love comes, it comes in such a way that there is no fear that can live there. And so there are times in my life where it's like, well, God, what is it going to look like? Or, or how come this? Or how come that? And the Lord's like, let that thing die. One of my husband, one of my favorite sermons he's ever preached is he talked about the year that King Uzziah died was the year that Isaiah had an encounter with the Lord. And the, th- the, the whole point of that sermon, I'm gonna, just going to, it's a great sermon, but the whole point of that sermon is the times in our lives when we allow fear and presumption and pride to die is when we really come and encounter the Lord. And so that's the first thing I see in 2 Samuel is there's a thing in us where we say, God, I just want you, and I'm not going to be afraid. I don't need to steady it. I don't need to put my hands on it. It's just you and your glory. Number two, the glory of God brings blessings to the house of God. I'm going to say something. It's kind of mean. 
between Glenda in the front cheering me on. <laughs> She's like, come on. See, sometimes we want to see an outpouring, but we can't even make it to church on a Friday night when we have a worship night. See, when the glory of God comes, it blesses the house of God. It changes things. It changes your family. It changes your life. I'm going to read this in the scripture because I didn't say it. Somebody else did, so I won't get in trouble. I love the Spirit Feel Life Bible. Um, I've been reading this specific uh, study Bible since I was a little girl, so it's nice. But uh, they have these things called Kingdom Dynamics, and Jack Hayford's a brilliant, brilliant theologian, lover of God, worship man of God, and he's with Jesus now. He's in glory. Okay, so there's this little part, and it's um, based off of Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. It says he's talking about revival and awakenings and what happens, and he says this is the work of the Spirit happens when we say, God, I want you to dwell literally be in my home and in my heart by faith that you would move me from being an acquaintance with your presence yeah. to being the center of everything I do. See, some of us are so okay with a Sunday morning version of Jesus with just a, a touching our toe in the river of God. And we want revival, and we want awakening, and we want these things. And God's like, when it comes, it blesses God's house. See, when the ark comes, it blesses the house of God because his presence isn't just for you. His presence is for everyone. His presence just isn't for you. His presence is for everyone. His presence is for everyone. And if it blesses the house of God, we become an outflow to our community, to our city, to our nation. Transformation happens when we understand it's not just for me. It's for God's house. The third thing I see, and I'm going to close in like five minutes, so I oh, see I'm fast, so fast. Oh, I didn't even read Ephesians. Gosh, okay, Ephesians it says, to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, 319, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do a seat exceedingly abundantly above all we can think or ask according to the power of that works in us. See, how do we become an outflow and a river of what God is doing? We understand that it's the power that he's already put inside of me though by the work of the Holy Spirit. And it becomes exceedingly and abundantly above. See, when I understand who God is and what he has done for me, my perspective changes, and I no longer see the temporal. I see eternal. I no longer see people as they are. I see them as God sees them. You know, there's this beautiful thing that I think Bill Johnson said it. Zach always says it. He says, don't stumble over people who, over who people aren't. How does it go? Celebrate who people are without stumbling over who they're not. That's just having God's eyes to see humanity. Yes. It's having God's eyes to see. Okay. Sometimes I think we ask God for things he already gave us. Should I go there? Yeah. I want your spirit, God. My spirit lives in you, and I said I'll never leave you or forsake you. See, we ask God for things. We ask him for things he already gave us. Yes. We need God in our midst. He's here. Open your eyes. Open your heart to see what he's doing. Come on. Yes, yes, yes. We ask him for things he's already given us. I think I said it last week, and I'm going to say it again. See, sometimes... When we ask God for something, he tells us, why don't you do the last thing I asked you to do, and maybe we can move on to the next. And it could be simple things like, love your family. Take care of your spouse. 
Take care of your church. Take care of your temple. Okay, I'm taking my time. All right. When we know who we are, we release what we carry. We're not orphans, but we have a good father. See, I didn't grow up knowing what a good father looked like. So I had to learn what it was. And now I understand what a good father does. I see my my princesses, my baby girls run up to their daddy, and he gives them whatever they want. Like he'll pretend like he doesn't, but he does. Whatever they want. What do you want, honey? Okay. That's a good father. See, I didn't understand that till I was older, but some of us in this room, we've always known what a good father looked like, and for some reason, we still act like orphans. We're still acting like we don't have everything we need for life and godliness right here. We're acting like we don't have everything we need inside of our belly. We're acting like what Jesus accomplished wasn't enough for us to do what he's called us to do. See, sometimes we don't understand what we carry. We carry the ark inside of us. See, David was so joyful when the ark had come back to his city that he danced before the Lord with all of his might. And on Monday, when I'm going to critique myself about this message tomorrow, and I'm going to feel really down about certain things, I'm going to remind myself that David stripped off his clothes and became undignified because he had what I care. See, not, under, not everyone will understand you, and you will be mocked, and you will be ridiculed. Because religion and the world and an antichrist spirit does not want to see his church free. And my, Mikhail, that's how you said it, we looked it up, Mikhail. She mocked David because when she saw what he was doing, she was completely offended. It should have been my dad who brought whatever, fill in the blank. She was upset that it wasn't her dad who brought the ark back. She was also upset that he didn't look the way he should have looked. So he wasn't the right person and he didn't have the right outer look. How many of you ever felt that way? I remember when we, you guys can come. I remember when we first planted the church, I told Zach, I'm like, I was never meant to be a pastor's wife, babe. Never meant. I don't have big hair, I don't play the piano, and I don't sing. Like, I don't know. You, you, you have to know. I, I, I can be really nice to people, but at the same time, like, I, like, there's a saying. You could take the girl out the hood, but you can't take all the hood out the girl. And so with Rochelle comes a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of little, there's some, there's some, stuff, there's some stuff in there. And I, I'm, I'm not apologizing for it, because I don't apologize for who I am. I just apologize when I'm wrong. And so, um, so there's some stuff that is not always nice. But some people don't like it. Some people don't like it. And so I told my husband, I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that I'm supposed to be your wife because I think you're supposed to be a pastor, but mm, I don't think it's for me. How many have ever felt like you're not in the right package and you don't have the right look? Or it's just not for you. It's religion. It's, it's an antichrist spirit that says you have not been called just as you are. You know, there's this like saying, it says God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. The callings of God are without repentance. You know what that means? He calls you no matter what it looks like. You ever get frustrated because it's like the messiest people? The messiest people. It's like, why are they prospering? Some messy people prosper. Jesus. Because the gifts of God are without repentance. God is calling us to say, I don't care 
who's shouting from the sidelines that I'm not good enough. I don't care who is on this side telling me I'm not the right person in the right package. It doesn't matter. I have the presence of God inside of me. And church, we're hungry. We're a church that's hungry for awakening, for a moving of God. But revival is inside of you. What are you doing with it? We're waiting for our, our kids to worship all the time around the clock. They will if you let them. I know them. What are we waiting for? Your revival. Live it in your home. Live it with your kids. Live it in your community. We are a move of God. It's inside of us. Now I want to believe it with my heart because sometimes, like I started this out, sometimes the natural, right, doesn't always let me see what he's doing. And even sometimes in the spirit, I'm just a little like, God, I want to see with your eyes and your heart. And so I pray that he lets, that you let him take you higher this morning. Give you vision this morning. I want to see with your eyes, God. I want to see with your heart. I want to see what you've put inside of me so that I can live it out as a living expression to my community to my church, and to my family, God. We want your presence more than anything. But I say that in a way that says, God, I want to be a river. And I want to remove whatever is damming up my river this morning. Whatever things, if it's fear, if it's um, control, God, if it's just, I don't, I'm afraid of what it looks like. I want to remove the dam that is hindering the flow of God that is inside of my belly, that you have put inside of me. Church, let this be a cry and a prayer from each one of us that says, I want your presence, God, but I don't want to wait for someone else to do it. I want to be a move of God. I want to be a river of God because I carry your glory and it's holy. It's holy and it's precious and I don't want to waste it another day. I don't want to waste what you've given me another day. And so I become a river of God. That is our heart, Jesus, this morning. That is our heart. Can you lift your hands with me? Maybe with your own words and your own song and your own just tell him. Tired of waiting for somebody to stir like the man next to the pool of Bethesda. Why, are, Jesus says, why are you, why are you sitting here waiting for your healing? He's like, nobody will put me in the river or nobody will put me in the pool. <laughs> it's almost silly. Jesus is like, Get up. Get up. Stop waiting for somebody else to do something and you do something. Jesus, let it be our cry. Not waiting. I am. I am a river of your presence. I carry your glory, God. I carry the ark inside of me. Let me be undignified like David because I am undone with who I am and what you've done for me. Because I'm undone with what I carry. Because I understand and I see what you see, Jesus. Let it be in me according to your will. Let it be 
be in me according to your will. That's the cry that Mary had when she carried Jesus. And that is the cry we have, but it was answered in the cross that what is in you according to the will of God is the resurrected Christ. The spirit of the resurrected Christ lives in you. It lives in us. And so let it be to me according to your will. Your spirit is inside of us. We carry your glory, God. We carry your glory, Jesus. We're going to open the altars, and they're going to worship the Lord a little bit. And so I just encourage you, if you want to come and spend some time with Jesus.